Loving and Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this remnant in the upper room. When we think of the thousands of people that are within walking distance of this chapel, who have chosen right now to reject you, that have prioritised the most mundane of things over coming to hear the word that brings eternal life. Lord, we grieve for them, we pray for their souls, but we also thank you for this opportunity to gather, Lord, this, this, what we have here is so precious. So Lord, let us embrace what we're doing now, with both our minds and our hearts. And um, may we leave challenged, edified, and more in love with Jesus. Amen. Amen. So um, I'm going to start with a question, and I hope the question makes sense. Otherwise, you're going to waste the next half an hour of your life. The question is, when your unbelieving friends, so your friends who are not Christians, do you have friends who are not Christians? Good. When your friends who are not Christians find out that you are a Christian, what do you think their first thoughts would be regarding what you actually believe in as a Christian? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. If your friends <coughs> scroll through your, your Facebook profile or your Twitter feed, it's not called Twitter anymore, is it? It's X. Or your Instagram feed or what have you, from the articles and videos and other content that you, <coughs> that you share, what do you think they will conclude in regards to your Christian faith? That's the question. What, what do your friends see in you that would shape their understanding as to what Christians believe? As a Christian, but I assume we're all Christians here, yeah? As a Christian, what do you talk about most in your place of work, or when you're out socialising with friends in the local cafe or what have you? What is always on the tip of your tongue? How, how would your friends <coughs> define what a Christian is based on your, your public witness to them? If I was to ask any one of your unbelieving friends, what do you believe in, how would they answer? Would they begin with your countercultural view on things like abortion or gender ideology? Would they think of your political persuasion? Does Politics take the, the centre stage in your, your conversation with your unbelieving friends. <clears throat> Would your friends think that being a Christian means to be a militant right-wing nationalist? Or would they think that being a Christian is being a, a left-wing hippie? Do they see Christ through you as Trump Jesus? Or... or or hippie Jesus? Would they think that as a Christian, or to be a Christian, is someone that would refute Darwinism or the, or the Big Bang Theory? Based on your witness as Christians, would your friends think that to be a Christian is to be a conspiracy theorist? You see that a lot in Christian circles today, don't you? People who profess to be believers, but then believe all this other crazy stuff too. The question I want you all to ask yourselves in this session is what beliefs do you express as priority in your Christian walk? And how would your unbelieving friends articulate your belief or what they perceive to be your belief? <coughs> based on, on the primary topics of your conversation with them. 
If we go back 2,000 years and ask the unbelieving friends of the early church the very same question, they would answer quite simply, my friend believes that Jesus <coughs> of Nazareth is the Christ, and he has risen from the dead. It's as simple as that. No politics, no social contention, no conspiracy theories, nothing other than those facts. Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ. He died, he rose again. That's what my friend believes. What does your Christian friend believe in? My friend believes that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ. And he is risen from the dead. In this session, I'm, I'm going to go through this statement with you. Biblically, you'll be pleased to know. I want to do it with four points. Demonstration, declaration, transformation and application. I'm not going to ask you to repeat them. I will repeat them because I've got my notes. <coughs> Demonstration, declaration, <coughs> transformation and application. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Can I just say, if I leave, it's not because I'm bored. <laughs> I've got to get out of 20, 20 to 6. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't mind if you left because you were bored. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for sharing. <coughs> he's only those four points, he's I'm not going to make it. <laughs> And then afterwards, if we have time, we'll have a time of discussion about what I've said. How does that sound? Good. I like to throw cats on my visions, so that I'm hoping that we can speak openly later. So, demonstration number one. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a historical <coughs> fact. We heard about that just now with Ian, didn't we? It's a historical fact, and the Gospel writers made every effort to demonstrate its actuality. In Matthew 28, we're told that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary met with the resurrected Jesus. And he comforted them and he, he commissioned them as he did the, the 11 disciples in Galilee at the end of the chapter. If we turn to Luke 24, we read an account of the risen Jesus eating and appearing to many witnesses. On the road to Emmaus, the resurrected Jesus opened the scriptures to reveal to the disciples that he, he has victory over the grave. Hallelujah. And at the end of John's Gospel, we read of the risen Christ seeking out the disciples. You remember it was Thomas who, who saw the scars of the cross. That's an important detail, isn't it? In John 20, 27, he died and rose again. You'll also remember that the risen Jesus, he restored Peter and he commissioned the disciples to testify to the resurrection. The resurrected Jesus then ascended to heaven. That's in Acts 1. So it's clear. In the early church, they really wanted people to know that Jesus had risen. Uh, had risen. The resurrection of Christ is, is the climax and conclusion of every gospel account. So that's the demonstration. Next is the declaration. For that we move beyond the gospels. We're now going to Acts and, and the letters. Now throughout the book of, of Acts, we see that the resurrection of Jesus is at the center of every account of gospel proclamation. Regardless of context, regardless of audience, regardless of the demographic, the resurrection was the central message of the early church. In Peter's sermon at Pentecost, he declares, Acts 2.32, God has raised this Jesus, we are all witnesses of this. When preaching in um, Solomon's colonnade, Peter accused his hearers of, of killing the source of life. The God of their ancestors, Acts 3.15, whom God raised 
from the dead. We're all witnesses of this, he says. Then before the Jewish leadership in Jerusalem, Peter and John were arrested in Acts 4 because, this was the charge, Acts 4 verse 2, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. That's the charge. They were taken away to be questioned regarding the, the healing of a disabled man. And Peter, he rebukes the court bravely. Acts 4.10. This man who is standing before you healthy is doing so by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who God raised from the dead. He could have just said Jesus from Nazareth, couldn't he? But he had to say Jesus of Nazareth, whom God raised from the dead. It was utterly central to the early church's proclamation. And the same message was preached again in Acts 5, when Peter was again on trial. This time he was on trial before the Sanhedrin. And in Acts uh, chapter 5, verse 30, he says, The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus. Then in the home of, of a Gentile Roman centurion, Peter again came with the same central message. Acts 10, 39 to 40. We ourselves are witnesses. God raised up this man on the third day and caused him to be seen. So for Peter, it was the resurrection that was the ultimate proof of Jesus' lordship. It was the resurrection that explained the necessity of Christ's suffering. It was the resurrection that was at the centre of the Christian message. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. amen. <clears throat> Moving on from Paul, uh, Peter, we now have Paul, originally Saul of Tarsus. Now he met with the resurrected Christ, didn't he? Who remembers where? Damascus. The Damascus Road, Acts chapter 9. And when in Antioch, shortly after that meeting, Acts 13, Paul preached, God raised him, being Jesus, from the dead. And he appeared for many days to those who are now witnesses. It was the centre of Paul's message too. In Thessalonica, Paul spent three Sabbaths in the synagogue, reasoning from the scriptures that the Messiah, guess what? Rose from the dead. Acts 17, 3. This caused a riot, and it presented Paul with an, uh, an invitation to, to present his case to the intellectual elite. So he goes to speak to philosophers in the uh, Areopagus, and Paul declares the very same message, Acts 17, 18. He declares the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Paul was brought to trial before Felix, and the charge of his trial, Acts 24, 21, was concerning the resurrection of the dead. He wasn't tried for anything else bar that, the claim that Jesus rose. And it's the same charge that was made against Paul in the court of Agrippa. So not only was it the centre of the early church's message, it was also received as the centre of the early church's message by non-believers. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Am I making central still with me? Mm -hmm. It's clear from these verses that the message of the early church had at its centre the resurrection. So if you're going to ask an unbelieving friend of Peter, or an unbelieving friend of Paul, or an unbelieving friend of any of the disciples at the time, what they thought they believed in as Christians, the answer is very simple, isn't it? Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ. And he rose again. He rose from the dead. Amen. Amen. We're whizzing through this. Part three, transformation. The resurrected Jesus, <coughs> he reconciled Peter and transformed Paul. The resurrected Jesus was at the centre of their preaching and it is through the same word preached today that the same resurrected Jesus is then revealed to us. Jesus is risen, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Say it with me. He is risen. He is risen. Indeed. 
is the first fruit of the new creation. The new creation that will come on the last day. Where both the righteous and the unrighteous will be resurrected and will all be judged. We're told that Acts 24, 15. And Paul says that this is a message, the message of most importance. It's a reality, as Ian said earlier, that is essential to the gospel presentation. It's a reality. Can you say that with me? It's a, it's a reality. reality. 1 Corinthians 15, 17, which Ian preached from earlier, Paul states that if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. Yeah. You are still in your sins. As Ian paraphrased earlier, go to the beach. What are you doing here? And my fear is, and, and my challenge for us all today to consider, it is in our attempts, however well-meaning they might be, to, to apply the gospel into different aspects of the modern age, whether that is political or, or scientific or, or cultural, have we as a church lost the key fundamental message of our faith, <coughs> which is that Christ has risen? And this brings us to our final point. Who remembers the final point? Ten points if you get it. Application. Brilliant. Application. The application of the resurrection of Jesus is, of course, all-encompassing and it's far-reaching. The fact that Jesus rose again should pervade into every aspect of, of human existence. Mm. Amen? Amen? Absolutely contentious topics like politics, like gender ideology, like, like gay marriage, like abortion, like euthanasia, like the new syllabus for our, for our children's education, various views on climate change, vaccines, the war in Ukraine, whatever. It all matters in light of and because of the resurrection of Christ. Amen? Amen. And yes, as Christians, it's, in, it's incredibly important for us to make a defence of our faith when we're met with such cultural resistance. I'm not saying we shouldn't have a voice in these areas. What I am saying is, has our voice clouded the central theme of the resurrection? If our message is not built <coughs> on the risen Christ, it's got no power. Amen? Amen. If you're debating, let's say, with a woman about her <coughs> recent abortion, for example, and your debate is not built on the hope that the resurrection can bring this woman, what foundation do you have to tell her that what she's doing is wrong? What hope of the resurrection are you giving her? Without the hope of the resurrection, that <coughs> is your key fundamental priority, your Christian witness, it just becomes a rant. You've become what Paul warns against, a, a clanging gong. You're just noise. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. Do so in gentleness and respect. What is the hope we have? It's the resurrection, isn't it? And I fear that as a church, our hope is is not in the resurrection, it's in the hope that women would stop having abortions. Our hope is not in the resurrection, it's, it's a hope that children will no longer suffer with gender dysphoria. Our hope is not in the resurrection, it's in the hope that, that our entire society suddenly, miraculously overnight will become entirely heterosexual. 
but we're trusting in our arguments to create political change rather than proclaiming the resurrected Christ. <coughs> Which is exactly what the early church did. And they changed the world because of it. Amen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The apostles did not preach politics. It's not in it. <coughs> they did not preach culture. <coughs> the contentious issue that challenged unbelievers around them was that Christ <coughs> rose again. It was in the proclamation of the resurrection of Christ that the culture was then impacted and changed. We've just gone through with the scriptures, whether they were in a synagogue, whether they were in the courts, whether they were in the home of a, of a Roman Gentile or in a lecture theatre filled with philosophers, the early church declared the same message, Christ is risen. It was at the heart of everything they said. Everyone knew what the disciples were on about. <coughs> And that's, that's, I suppose, my challenge for you. <coughs> if I asked one of your unbelieving friends, what do you believe? Would they say, oh, they have, they have different views of me on gay marriage? Oh, they, they believe in creationism, not evolution. Or do they say the resurrection? If they don't, you've got to check yourself. You've got to check your messaging. The resurrection was at the centre of the proclamation of the early church. <coughs> and this message of the risen Jesus wasn't just, as Ian said earlier, some idea or philosophy. It was applied in the newness of their lives. Amen? Amen. They lived it out. The early church proclaimed that, that Jesus had beaten death and they backed this message with their lives. Philippians 1.21, you know it. For me to live <coughs> is Christ. To die is gain. The unbelieving friends of the apostles knew exactly what they were about. Could our unbelieving friends say the same about us? If they scrolled through your Facebook or your Twitter or your Instagram, they listen to you for an hour in a cafe or a phone conversation, but they leave that conversation thinking, my friend believes that Christ has risen. It's a fear that we in the West, 21st century Christians, we've lost the wonder of the resurrection. It's not on the tip of our tongues like it was in the early church. In fact, we've reduce the proclamation of our risen Lord to our own apologetic hobby horses, whatever that may be. And that's why we're not seeing any fruit from our labours. Because we're preaching politics or culture, not the resurrection. Ask yourselves, what would your unbelieving friends say? what you believe as a Christian. Would they say creationism? Would they say pro-life? <clears throat> Would they say traditional views on marriage? I'm not disagreeing with those points. I'm just saying they're not priority. They're a fruit of. Amen? Amen? I want your friends to say they believe that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ and he rose again. It is this, this fundamental truth <coughs> of the resurrection of Jesus that the Bible calls us to, that gives light and, and hope and, and life into to all other various contentious issues that I, I fear we are all in danger of getting too lost and carried away with as a church. I'm not saying we shouldn't have a voice on these issues. I'm saying 
end up being carried away with them. Paul writes to the church in Rome, Romans 8, 11, the spirit who raised Christ from the dead is in you. It's in you. Why is that on the tip of your tongue? We need to be bold in our proclamation, don't we? Not bold in our politics, <clears throat> bold in our proclamation. And what's that? The good news about Jesus Christ, his resurrection. And then we, we need to apply this in, in the newness of our lives. Just as the other church did.